Okay, welcome to the new lecture um, in our series of le in lecture series on intellectuals organized by the Institute for Labor Studies here from Ljubljana. I'm very happy to introduce today's lecturer, Isidora Grubacki, uh, who recently finished her PhD at Central European University and, is, and works at the Institute of Contemporary History here in Ljubljana. And Isidora, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nessa. Thank you for inviting me and thank everyone for coming today. Um, I will talk about this theme of interwar Yugoslav feminisms, so feminisms between uh, the First and the Second World War. And as Nessa said, this is a topic that I have been researching for a, uh, for a long time now. It was my PhD topic, which I'm now uh, working, I'm now working on the book. Uh, but uh, I chose today most of the things that I uh, already, to talk about things that I already published here and there in some blogs and mini articles. And I'm just saying this in case someone uh, is interested in the topic and wants to maybe uh, read more, not only of what I wrote about, but also uh, there's a lot of literature reference there. So I, I didn't uh, do it now on the slide. Um, so, as the lecture series concerns, uh, in, and just to ask, do you, does everyone hear me well? Should I speak louder? Okay. So, uh, as the lecture series concerns intellectuals, and my research has been on the intellectual history of feminisms in interwar Yugoslavia, I think that this discussion can fit nicely into the broader seminar team, especially because most of the women who wrote about feminism and were active in feminist movement in interwar period were intellectuals of some kind. So this focus on intellectuals will give me, I think, a bit more space to emphasize some issues that I think are relevant when we think about history of feminism. So maybe to start from the beginning, when I started my research, I had uh, some very basic questions in my mind when, when I was uh, just conceptualizing what I want to do and what I want to read about. And my main question was basically, what was feminism in interwar Yugoslavia? As I couldn't really uh, find... Uh, uh, a, let's say a good enough article or a book that would actually uh, encompass this topic sufficiently. So I was wondering, was it a loosely defined concept? Was it an ideology or an organization or a movement? Or uh, was it maybe a bit of all of this? So in other words, I wondered what should primarily be my focus. I uh, I was thinking that perhaps one way would be to focus on women's organizations in general and feminist organizations specifically. Then another uh, option could be to focus on the women who defined themselves and feminists, as feminists in this period. Um, another option would be to focus on the texts that were about feminism or on the way this concept of feminism was used and understood at the time, because it, it was at the time understood differently than today. And this was one of the main issues for me. What, what did feminism mean for the women at the time? So in the end, I actually found ways to connect these different aspects. And I focused on the intersection of organizations, individuals, concepts they used and the ideas they had. And today I will just tell you some aspects, uh, aspects of what I think could be interesting and important when thinking about feminism and intellectuals in the interwar period. Um, and I will tell you first a bit about the context that I find relevant for this talk. And then um, I decided to focus on four uh, feminist intellectuals and organizers and their ideas. And these are Aloysia Stebi, Angela Vode, Mitra Mitrovic, and Milka Žicina. Um, there are... Um, a couple of things maybe that I'm, I wish that uh, my, that stay with you from today's talk, and I will mention them now and come back to them uh, in the conclusion as well. Uh, one is that there, uh, in the, that in the interwar period there was uh, not one idea of feminism, and there were as many different ideas about what feminism is or should be as there are today. Uh, feminisms were many, and as I see it, feminisms or feminist political thought was always connected to some other political projects. So, in other words, when someone would argue for feminist ideas, with this they would bring also other political ideas. And what was interesting to me was to inter interpret this, to see uh, how different individuals uh, uh, argued for, for, for women's rights, for instance, and what kind of other uh, political concepts were important for them. 
And that will show that the feminist voices were indeed many. Uh, however, most of the time, it seems to me that these political projects uh, were on the left side of the spectrum. And this is the second thing that I would like to suggest in this talk, to uh, maybe try to see this as different kind of um, different kinds of feminisms, uh, which are um, in a way beyond this uh, division that is very uh, often uh, that we can very often find in historiography. And this is something that I that that was primary problem for me in the given literature, is that there is a lot of this division between so-called bourgeois feminism on the one side and communist feminism on the other side. So this somehow implies that, oh, there were some liberal feminists who wanted some, who just wanted women's rights, but didn't care about society in general. And then there were communists who hated feminism, but uh, they wanted uh, revolution, and then they included the woman question within it. And uh, this is the division that I, uh, looking at the sources, just did not find useful at all. So uh, this is something that I will try to develop throughout the talk. And finally, uh, I included continuities and transformations in the title, and this is the third thing that I hope stays with you. I will show you some examples from different moments in the interwar period, from the mid-20s, uh, early 1930s, uh, and then also second half of the 1930s. And through this, I uh, wish to show what I see as a transformation of predominant feminist politics. Um, so in order to understand this better, uh, let me first then tell you something about the context of the interwar period and this uh, main feminist organization at the time, and then I will move on to the women that I mentioned. So, um, first, uh, a couple of words about interwar Yugoslavia. Although we all know the general framework, but I would like to emphasize now uh, a bit more this aspect of transformations and changes uh, in politics from the early 1920s to the late 1930s. Uh, Yugoslavia was a new post-First World War country founded in 1918, and it was, uh, when it was founded, it was a parliamentary centralized monarchy with a center in Belgrade. And uh, as we all know, the country brought together former parts of Ottoman and Habsburg empires, as well as the independent kingdoms of Serbia and Montenegro. And then uh, what is important is that in the 1920s, it had a very, very unstable political system. There were many elections, governments were changing too quickly, and this politically volatile situation resulted uh, uh, with the assassination in the parliament, which happened in the summer of 1927, uh, when a member of the Radical Party killed several members of the Croatian Peasant Party. And then... Uh, one of the consequences was that in 1929, King Alexander decided to dissolve the parliament and to assume dictatorial powers in the country. He banned political parties, and this dictatorship lasted until the king was assassinated in 1934. Uh, and then as a reaction to this dictatorship, a strong anti-regime and then also anti-fascist movement emerged with the Communist Party in the lead. Uh, the Communist Party uh, in Yugoslavia had been illegal already since 1920, and after a long period of factional struggles and uh, ultra-leftism, it consolidated around 1932, and then it undertook a so-called united front from below strategy of cooperation with various political parties. And this is... Uh, also, uh, in this period, also, the Communist Party uh, had significantly grown, and it, it supported their members' activism in various legal organizations. So this is important for my story, uh, uh, also because, as I will mention, uh, this is when communist, young communist women uh, in Yugoslavia uh, entered the feminist uh, organizations in the context of the Popular Front corporations. But more generally, this uh, story of political history in Yugoslavia is important for me because this is the context in which and against which feminists organized and in which and against which they argued for the improvement of, of uh, women in, in society. So they didn't do it, uh, of course, uh, in an abstract manner, but it was always connected to the specific system. So uh, my interest was in the story about how feminism in Yugoslavia developed and transformed during this period. And I find, found it relevant to take into account this whole Yugoslav context, uh, or rather to consider three 
Yugoslav intellectual and organizational centers, which were Bel Belgrade, Zagreb, and Ljubljana in one fr framework, and also to explore how women from uh, Yugoslavia cooperated. And then uh, the way they cooperated actually brings me to the organization, which is the center of my attention for two reasons. One reason is practical because this organization served me also as an organ served as an organizing principle for my thinking about this topic because somehow it is uh, very important to to keep a, a focus on something in order to not, not have you know a completely dispersed argument and ideas. And the second reason concerns the fact that this was the organization that was called and considered feminist at the time. So actually, if we have an organization that was kind of synonymous with, how, with feminism in, in the period, we can understand how feminism was officially understood. And this organization was, uh, as I wrote on the slide, uh, uh, called uh, Alianza Ženskih Pokreta or Alianza Ženskih Pokretov. Um, the Alliance of Women's Movements, uh, and it was founded initially as the Feminist Alliance in 1923. It was formed, uh, so in 1923 it was formed in Ljubljana, and uh, those who formed it were representatives of different feminist organizations from Ljubljana, Belgrade, Zagreb, and Sarajevo. Uh, then this feminist alliance functioned in this form only briefly, um, but its great ex greatest success was that it stimulated the establishment of many new ženski pokret organizations in the country, ženski pokret or, or women's movement. This is how it was also called in Ljubljana because they wanted this unity in the whole country that everyone uh, uses the, the same name. Uh, and uh, so these Ženski Pokret organizations were from then on uh, the bearers of feminism, let's say, in the country. And in 1926, they gathered again and they restructured this Feminist Alliance organization, uh, renamed it into the Alliance of Women's Movements, uh, Alianza of all these <laughs> Ženski Pokret in the, in the state. Uh, and in this form, this organization continued to function and to grow uh, throughout the 1920s. However, the organization's work declined after the introduction of the royal dictatorship in Yugoslavia in 1929. And uh, there is a whole reason for that that I will not come uh, get into it now. But uh, main issue was that uh, basically the organization was asking for suffrage rights. But then when the dictatorship happened, they had to remove this uh, demand from their program. And in a way, just... Uh, just with, like with other organizations that weren't connected directly with the state, they just kind of, uh, they were still, they still existed, but they weren't so uh, uh, numerous as before. But then the situation changes in the 1930s when young communist women across the country began to join these Zhensky pocket organizations in different uh, towns. And they began to establish uh, youth sections where young women began to gather. And according to the existing, existing sources, it is uh, possible to conclude that these youth sections were uh, much more inclusive in terms of, um, for instance, um, they, it included younger women of different classes, mostly students and, and also, in some cases, working class women. However, its leaders were mostly students, that is, uh, in a way, women intellectuals still. And the most active uh, Zhensky Pokret youth section was in Belgrade. And it was a group led by uh, students who mostly came uh, from outside of Belgrade, however. And the women who were members of the youth section uh, published the journal, Žena Danas, Woman Today. Uh, this was an anti-fascist magazine for democracy and peace, which pursued a left feminist political agenda, uh, and it had a profile which attracted the youth. It was published between 1936 and 1940, and this is one of the main sources that I that, that I used uh, for this talk and uh, for for my work in general. But there were many other. Uh, there was a uh, journal Ženski Svet in Zagreb, for instance, that was published from 39 to 41. That was uh, much similar, and uh, there were other publications throughout the country that were student, uh, uh, youth left journals and uh, but these two were uh, uh, the only ones focusing on women only. So in 
So, um, in general, then, this organization, Alianza Ženskih Pokreta, was active from 1923 until 1940, and its, uh, its program encompassed issues uh, which included women's suffrage rights, uh, which, however, were, uh, so women's suffrage, uh, so, of course, at the time, women did not have a uh, right to vote. So, uh, they wanted, uh, they demanded women's right to vote, but they understood this only as, uh, not as a goal in itself, but as means for complete women's liberation. They also, uh, in their program, had uh, demand for women's equal rights with men in both private and public rights. Uh, they advocated for the legal changes to improve women's equality in the sphere of women's work and economic independence. Uh, they wanted equal parenthood rights, uh, women's rights to inheritance, the protection of mothers, then also equal professional and educational opportunities, and the full participation of women in political life for the purpose of their influence uh, on the state and society. So these were some of the most important aspects of their program. And these demands would remain the same throughout the interwar period. So this is something that was the core of, of the feminist agenda. Um, and, uh, and as I say, the, the, the organization changed in the 1920s. It was growing slowly. Then it had a decline in the, uh, during the dictatorship. And then it was revitalized by uh, the, the young communist women. So uh, this is the, the general framework that I wanted you to have before I uh, give some more examples. But then this organization uh, was somehow for me only a starting point and a case study to look at something else. And I didn't want to look at organization as a depersonalized entity, like, you know, to look at the organization as a subject, organization did this or that, but actually to, to understand that the organization is made by people and these people have ideas. So now I will focus on four examples, which I hope will be interesting to you. Um, uh, all of them connected one way or another to the Alianza Ženskih Pokreta and, and show you that there were actually many different uh, ideas that were there, even though the core was the same. Uh, so these are the, the four women that I will uh, talk about, more or less. Uh, the first one is, uh, I will now just introduce all of them before focusing on their ideas. Um, and all of them were in one way or another connected to Alianza. So the first one is Alois Yashtebi. Uh, she was in many ways a central figure to this organization. She was born in Ljubljana in 1883, at the time still, of course, Austria-Hungary. And she was educated to be a teacher. She work, worked briefly in a school, but in 1910s she quit, and then she began working for the Social Democratic Party in Slovenia. And she edited uh, their journals and organized the Women's International Day celebration. Uh, uh, so she was very uh, much politically active even before the war. Then after the war, uh, she uh, began working for the Ministry of Social Politics in Ljubljana. And she actually remained in similar positions in Ljubljana and then in Belgrade uh, throughout the interwar period. And she also worked in, uh, for the ministry in the socialist uh, Yugoslavia until her death in 1956. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know still uh, what kind of work she actually did there. Uh, I haven't myself did research on that or I haven't found sources yet, but this would be uh, very interesting. But when it comes to her uh, political and feminist activism, in 1919, she left the Social Democratic Party and she began her activism in various women's organizations. And she was actually uh, the most active one in initiating cooperation between newly formed feminist organizations in Belgrade, Ljubljana and Zagreb. She began to gather women who demanded more fiercely than others uh, legal and social equality of women, and also, of course, women's political rights. And it was, I would argue her uh, activism that that led to the establishment of the Feminist Alliance in September 1923 in Ljubljana, and this is probably why it was also in Ljubljana and not somewhere else. And she was the, uh, the long-term president of this organization all, all until 1940. Uh, in the meantime, she had moved in Belgrade. I think she lived there between 
1927 and 1940 or something like that. And then the second woman is uh, Angela Vaudet. Uh, for many, she has been confusing because she was, uh, uh, I mean, in historiography, because she was a feminist and a member of a feminist organization, but then her ideas were actually Marxist ideas and she was also a member of the Communist Party um, uh, throughout the interwar period. Uh, so a bit about her, she was born in 1892, and uh, so she was about 10 years younger than Alozia Stebi, and uh, she came from a family of a railway, uh, railway worker. Her education was quite similar to Stebi's, so she studied to become a teacher, um, but then she worked in elementary schools and then later switched to work with children with disabilities. Uh, she was a member of many women's organizations, but was uh, the most active in Ženski pokret in Ljubljana. Uh, so this was the Ljubljana section of the Alliance of Women's Movements. And she was, um, she was actually its vice president. And she was also a member of the Communist Party of Yugoslavia, as I said, she was, but she was expelled in the winter of 1939 uh, because she disagreed with the non-aggression pact uh, between Nazi Germany and Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, she did not publish that much in the 1920s, uh, but in the early 1930s, she began to publish articles uh, in uh, some uh, daily uh, newspaper once a week in a rubric called Woman in the Contemporary World, Ženo Sodobnem Svetu. There she wrote about feminism, fascism, and many other topics. And then uh, in... Uh, very early on, from 1933, actually, she wrote against fascism. In 34, she published a book, Žena u današnji družbi, uh, Woman in Contemporary Society, uh, while her booklet, Fascism i Žena, uh, was published in 1935 in the Serbian language in Belgrade, so this was part of this Žena u današnji družbi. Uh, and in both these uh, works and in some other uh, articles, she discussed uh, the relationship between a woman and fascism in the context of the economic crisis and the, uh, Hitler's uh, power, actually, in the early 1930s. Uh, and I will talk about that a bit later. Uh, so then, whereas these two women were active feminists already in the 1920s, uh, the third one is Mitra Mitrovic, and she comes into the story only in the uh, 1930s. Uh, she was born in 1912 in a small Serbian town, and uh, of course younger than the others, uh, she belonged to a generation which barely remembered the First World War, but was still traumatized by it. Uh, she enrolled in the studies of Yugoslav literature at the Faculty of Arts uh, at the University of Belgrade in 1930. And uh, she did not take much before becoming active in the progressive student movement, uh, which was, uh, as I mentioned earlier, happening. And in this period, she met her future husband, uh, communist and intellectual Milo Vangelas, who was married to Mitrovic between 36 and 52. And she was uh, also an, an active member of the Communist Party in the 1930s, uh, officially since 1933. Um, after the war, I mean, during the war, she was uh, in the partisan army, and then in the post-45 period, she was an active politician, uh, minister of education, etc., and she was active until mid-1950s. Uh, so her connection with the Alliance of Women's Movements was uh, actually this youth section which she led from 1935 in, in Belgrade. Um, and I, I think that her activism and bro more broadly uh, Ženski Pokret's youth section, uh, Ženski Pokret youth section's activism should be seen in the broader, in the context, this broader context of the progressive youth movement, um, which from the beginning of 30s organized uh, a strong anti-regime, pacifist and anti-fascist movement in, in Yugoslavia. Um, this, uh, uh, just not to repeat, sorry about this. Um, so her activism began basically in the early 1930s uh, at the university, where there was a circle of communist students in Belgrade who started to gather and exchange social and Marxist literature. And it was these books and circles which offered the initial way of thinking through the dissatisfaction of, of, of her generation and seeking for causes for what they were feeling, basically. And um, 
we I mean, I, I see Mitra Mitrovic here, I'm mentioning her not because she's the most important person, but as an example of this generation of left feminist activists who were active in the student movement, movement in the 30s. But we know much about her and actually we, I think we will know increasingly about her um, with some uh, new uh, publications that are coming. Uh, Basically, because she survived the war, she was also uh, well known for, you know, being a wife of Milo Vangelis, and she also uh, left writings behind her. Uh, recently, there was a, like uh, in September last year, a memoir published about her activism in the 30s, edited by by Veljko Stanić, and I also very much recommend you to look at the works of Veljko Stanić and Stanislava Barac if you are interested uh, to to read more about her. However, what I want to say is that she was only one of many women who wrote and published uh, from this left feminist perspective in the mid 30s. Uh, among them uh, were, for instance, in Zagreb, uh, Magda Boskovic, who, like many, many others, did not survive the war. So we don't have first account uh, uh, experiences from, from them. Or, for instance, there were some other women who did survive and who were later active in AFG and some other uh, organizations, for instance, Jelena Jančić from Zagreb or in Ljubljana, this was Erna Muser. Um, among them was also Milka Žicina, uh, who uh, contributed to the communist feminist political thought as a writer, and I put her here as a fourth example, uh, because I, I consider her like a different kind of intellectual, and I wanted to present her as well. She was a worker, political activist, and a writer with a rural and working class background. Uh, she was born in 1902, um, so slightly older than Mitra Mitrovic. Born in a small vi village in Slavonia, she moved to Belgrade when she was 17, but then decided to leave Belgrade and then spent her, uh, her 20s as a working class traveler seeking for jobs across Europe. So she was literally walking from Austria, Germany, France, Belgium. She worked as a domestic servant in a garden, in a music store, in some other manufactories. So basically, she was going around and looking for, for work. Uh, she was also a communist political activist. Uh, she began her activism in Paris in the 1920s, where she met uh, some of the uh, Yugoslav communist emigres, and she was active in a communist trade union and would go to the outskirts of Paris and uh, uh, in, in one of the interviews that I read uh, from her, and this is the biggest source that we have, she, she said that she would go to outskirts and then she would seek for Yugoslav workers and try to somehow talk to them and explain to them how they should uh, start uh, um, thinking differently about their work and more about uh, this communist cause. Uh, and then in early 1930s, she came back to Belgrade. She got closer to the local communist activist circles. Later, she joined the youth section of Ženski Pokret. And, this, and in this context, she also became a writer of socially engaged literature. Uh, in the 1930s, she wrote many short stories and two novels. Um, and together with Mitra Mitrovic, she was a member of editorial team of the journal Žena Danas, uh, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, and the program conceptualized in this journal was called New Feminism, and I will tell you something about my understanding of that uh, later on. So these, uh, these are four of many women who contributed to the work of the Alliance of Women's Movements in Yugoslavia in the interwar period. And through their writing and through their activism, they actually shaped or co-shaped feminism at the time. And we see that they're quite different, yet somehow they, they share many common traits. So now let's turn to their ideas, which can, can help us understand the multiplicity of, of, of feminist voices at the time. Uh, the first one is um, uh, Aloysia Stebi. Uh, as I mentioned, I find her one of the most important uh, women in the feminist movement uh, in Yugoslavia, uh, especially in the 20s. Um, and I also mentioned that she was active already before the First World War as a social democrat. So for me, it was very in interesting when I started to research this topic, uh, when I realized that actually one of the leading feminists had actually social democratic ideas. And, and this was maybe one of the first things that helped me, um, in a way, um, 
crash these bourgeois families and communism uh, division that existed and to start thinking about this differently. Um, so uh, I also mentioned that she later worked for the state, for the Ministry of Social Politics, and she was very interested in these social uh, politics topics. Uh, and her feminism was actually very closely intertwined uh, with her social democratic politics and with, we, with her other work. And it is possible to understand it from the perspective of, of her activism as a whole. She was, I think, a pragmatic intellectual whose political thought was very closely connected to, to her practice and to the context in which she worked. And she always somehow, uh, she wrote about it a lot. And you can see if you read everything that she wrote that she was constantly thinking what was the situation she, in, she, in which she was, who were the people that she can cooperate with and how then from this very context she can do something more about it. So in this, in this context, practice was very uh, important to her. Uh, and for her, uh, the main interest was that women should cooperate and bring some kind of change to the society and the state. So, of course, on the one hand, she worked for the state, but it's also important that after the establishment of the new state, she endorsed the kingdom of uh, Serbs, Croats and Slovenes. So she and many other families uh, which she, uh, with which she cooperated, they... they uh, uh, supported the state, but also were not really happy about how it, tur it turned out. So they wanted constantly to change it. And she was always thinking about what women can do to make it uh, better. Uh, and exactly because she was the leader of the self-proclaimed uh, feminist movement, it is important to understand what she meant by feminism and what kind of politics she was trying to promote through it. And apart from her, I will also give some examples of, of uh, how her closest colleague, uh, Milena Tanatswicz from Belgrade, who was also one of the leading feminists and who also worked at the Ministry for Social Politics, defined it. Um, so then, okay, so then what, what were the issues that she connected with feminism? The first was that uh, for her, feminism was closely connected to women's rights. And this is in terms of women's rights to education and work, divorce, uh, rights of custody of children, gender pay gap, and all these issues that I already mentioned, actually, when I mentioned the, the core of the feminist program. Uh, but then the... the um, well, we can take that uh, for granted because it was somehow uh, continuous for everyone and the same. Uh, what is important is that another concept important for her was the state, the concept of state. So she always, uh, and also uh, Stebi and Milana Tanatskovic, always when they talked about feminism, somehow state was uh, a very uh, close concept to it. Uh, so, for instance, uh, one example is Milana Tanatskovic uh, defined feminism, and this is one of the earliest, actually, definitions that I could find uh, in 1923. She defined it as, quote, the aspiration of women to share with men all the concerns and responsibilities for the management of the biggest social community, the state. And uh, she argued that the development of women's joint work would allow for all members of society to have the same rights, uh, quote, regardless of their sex, class, or nationality. Uh, notably, she described the state as the social community. It was not uh, for her a national community, which was quite interesting for me. And she emphasized in this way this social dimension of feminism, uh, which brings me to the following point, which concerns the distinction between charity and social work that Stebi was always talking about. So basically, when she began to use the term feminist and purely feminist, she used it to say that many women's organizations were not purely feminist because they were primarily charitable. Uh, so she, in fact, used the term feminism in opposition to this idea of charity. So perhaps a bit of context is useful here uh, for a better understanding of why this was important for her, especially, as I said, that she was always kind of working in the context and trying to, to change the given circumstances. And this is that uh, the Feminist Alliance was actually established as an alternative to the other national women's organization, the National Women's Council, which existed from 1919 in Yugoslavia. 
uh, and uh, Stebi and her close associates were all from the beginning very active in this organization as well. But this organization gathered most women's organizations in the state. And uh, you can imagine that most of the, these were uh, charitable, like patriotic organizations with led by elite women um, and uh, actually led by many of them led by women who had been uh, in the, also close to the court, for instance, uh, etc. And... Uh, Feminists were uh, were active in this National Women's Council, but they were quite a small group. But this organization gave them a platform to develop their cooperation in the early 1920s. So this is basically when the first time women from Zagreb, Ljubljana, Belgrade and other parts of the country met. And this is how they began to cooperate and to build their cooperation based on the focus on women's suffrage and this view on the state as a social community. And it was uh, also important for them to emphasize women's public work. Um, so, for instance, as I said, they worked for the ministry, and this was kind uh, this idea of public work for the state and women actually contributed things somehow was uh, quite different than the understanding, for instance, of a wife of a minister who organizes some charity work. Uh, and this was the case uh, for one of the women that they openly confronted at one point. So uh, it was in this context of the dissociation uh, from the more elite, higher class women that some Yugoslav feminist activists began to use the term feminism more often. Um, Stebi always used it uh, in this early 1920s in opposition to charity. And she argued that charity was an artificial and humi humiliating action for everyone involved. She argued that true social assistance must come from a feeling of social duty towards the social community to which be we belong. So we see always this uh, emphasis on, on the importance of the social community. And uh, in contrast to charity, she insisted that social reforms and social justice were the ideas close to feminism. And she described social justice as the strongest and most solid basis of a calm and fruitful common life all, of all members of society. So we see here that in the, already in the 20s, this concept of feminism was highly politicized and it brought, to get, brought with itself uh, some other ideas of social justice, social reform, etc. Um, and the, the feminists believed at the time that women carry these ideas of social reforms with them and that if they take part in the state, somehow everything will be better. And then another issue of conflict with this, uh, some of the women from the National Women's Council was suffrage. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned already, according to Stebi, the goal of suffrage right was not suffrage right in itself, but uh, for her, this was the uh, ability to vote, to be elected and to f fulfill their social duties and to contribute to changing the society for the better. So uh, this also goes against uh, maybe this idea that we might have, oh, they just wanted suffrage. No, they wanted suffrage because they wanted something else and it was always some other kind of politics that was behind it. Um, here it might be also important just briefly to mention Stebi's view on politics as this is something that she often wrote about, especially in this turbulent period of 20s with you know assassin assassinations and everything that I mentioned. Uh, she was very, very critical of the political system at the time uh, and uh, basically what is important for me to emphasize is that at this point in the 20s there was a lot of discussion about politics in the feminist press even though uh, feminism was supposed to be politically neutral, so it was not connected to one political party, but they always insisted that women should be interested in politics and that they should be uh, kind of participating in political parties. This changed at some point, uh, and this is why we all always need to think about a different, like how context uh, changes and how things change. Because, for instance, in 1940, there was a new leadership of the alliance, and they claimed that feminism had nothing to do with politics whatsoever, and that it was only about suffrage and only about women's professional opportunities. Uh, but, as I said, in the 20s, there was a lot of discussion about uh, politics, and for Stebi, uh, 
the evo- uh, she argued that the evolution of feminism was, was inseparable from the political life of a country more broadly, and that a necessary precondition for the development of feminism in Yugoslavia was actually the reform of political parties. Uh, but she also criticized political parties because she said that uh, they were based on particular interests of certain religious or language groups, and she thought that ideology was something that should be behind each political party, that they should have political pro- pro- program and that then women from the whole state should be voting according to the program and, and not according to uh, their religion or whether they're Slovenian or Serbian or, or other. Um, so this is uh, all that I will say for now about Štebi. And now let's move to Angela Vode and her ideas about feminism. Uh, and I will just tell you one part of her, which I consider important for the kind of transformation that feminism uh, uh, that happened with feminism in the early 30s with the rise of uh, fascism. Um, and this is exactly when Angela Vode, as I said, uh, began to publish more. Uh, I, I will focus only now, not on her, her writings in general, but on the way she evaluated how fascism endangered women and thus offered the feminist evaluation of feminism, oh, fascism, actually. So uh, she interpreted fascism from the perspective of historical materialism um, and argued that it was uh, the last stage of capitalist development and uh, it represented the revolt of the increasingly impoverished middle classes. But uh, so this was her like Marxist take on on um, uh, on fascism. But for her, much more than uh, defining fem- fascism was important to actually show and to argue what fascism did, and especially what it did to women, but also to working class in general. So she kept writing and explaining that fascists would claim or pretend to be revolutionary. But then in Italy and Germany, the first thing they did was to destroy the working workers' movement and the trade unions. And her argument was that uh, one of the key aspects of fascism was that in, it endangered women's rights, and specifically their political rights and their right to work. And at the same time, it pushed women towards marriage and motherhood. So. Uh, This is something that most of us know, but uh, basically in this context, we see how it was important for her also as the vice president of a feminist organization to claim that fascism was directly anti-feminist and endangering. I mean, she didn't use this word, but endangering these uh, feminist demands. Uh, She argued then uh, directly, for instance, against ideologues of fascism and national socialism, for instance, Alfred Rosenberg, uh, and she said that uh, his idea uh, was dangerous that state society and battlefield belong to men, whereas motherhood and the home belong to women. And here again, we see this uh, the importance of the claim that women should have public work for the state. So state is not only for men, but women have to be a part of it as well. And uh, if we have this in mind, we can see to what extent it was important for feminists to argue that yeah, exactly that, that their work is important for state and society. So she also gave examples of Italy where women had no political rights, Germany where women's salaries were 50% lower than men's and where women were losing their jobs. And she was always arguing that fascist regimes were just pretending to be uh, supportive of women only before marriage, but after marriage they forced women to orient themselves exclusively towards family and children. So she wrote about this, she gave lectures about this, she was very, very uh, active uh, even before this like global left feminist uh, movement began to organize in 1934. And I think that looking globally, she is a very important thinker and activist in this sense because she already, in in the Slovenian and Yugoslav context, conceptualized some things that would become... uh, even more important later in on the global level. Uh, so I see her as a precursor of the anti-fascist turn of feminism, which came more massively in the 30s. And in Yugoslavia, this is when Yugoslav communist, uh, young communist women uh, joined the feminist movement. And uh, this is visible in this program of new feminism, which I uh, mentioned earlier and which I will talk about uh, now 
uh, a bit more. Uh, this new feminist program is in line with what uh, what Angela Vaude uh, wrote about. So if we look at the quote from New Feminism Program from 1936, um, we see that anti-fascism basically becomes the core of this movement. They say, today we clearly see that uh, with a single decree, fascist countries stripped women of all rights they gained throughout the years. Fascist ideology is founded on the idea that women are considered second-class citizens who are not able to perform public work and as such must return to the heart of the home. The fascist heart of the home is the greatest fallacy by which women are fooled into giving up their social ro roles without a fight. In Germany, uh, today, a woman has to serve as a reproductive machine so that there will be enough soldiers for fascism's militant plans. Uh, so basically, anti-fascism is something that will remain the key in the feminist movement throughout the 30s. And now let us turn to this new feminism now, with a focus on Mitra Mitrovic and Milka Žicina and their journal uh, Žena Danas, uh, which was conceptualized, uh, and, and this uh, yeah, uh, program, uh, New Feminism, which was conceptualized in the first issue of the journal. Um, regarding this concept, uh, what is what was interesting to me is that actually it was communist women who used the term feminism and new feminism uh, which again goes to, goes against this division uh, of bourgeois feminism and communism, uh, and we see that actually at the time uh, this was not such a bad word for them as it might have been later after Vida Tomčić officially said no to it in 1940. Uh, the concept new feminism was used only once uh, in this first issue of Jana Danas, and this might lead us to think that it was only a strategic choice to contribute to legalizing communist women's activism. Uh, so this was, I think, the story earlier in historiography. Well, they had to pretend, and then they used the term, etc. However, I also find uh, uh, one of the things that I, I think uh, speak against this is that I, uh, there are also sources which demonstrate that the concept was not perceived negative, negatively at the time by, by everyone but mostly by those who were against feminist ideas. So, for example, there was a, a Zagreb student journal, a communist student journal at the time, which published an article about feminism. And in this, uh, in this article, the author spoke about the double subjection of women, explained that feminists demand equality in society, um, and also are, uh, uh, repeated all these demands that... I mentioned earlier, and I don't want to uh, uh, repeat again. And uh, the author also said that many negative views about feminism, for, for instance, that feminists are single women who hate men, that they are just uh, sexually problematic, that they endanger the family. Uh, she argued that all these ideas were created by those who wanted to... Just, just for one, don't one, one, one short... One short movement. Uh, everybody. I would say uh, no. This, but is, this is the short movement. Yes. Okay. Make it shorter. <laughs> Can I? Or? Yeah. Okay. So basically, that the, that that. All, all these ideas were actually generating a negative image of feminism for the youth. And, and this author wanted to promote feminism, especially their demands for equality in marriage and society and uh, women's suffrage rights, etc. And um, so taking this example uh, of new feminism and some other examples, it is possible to conclude that even though the young and communist women in Yugoslavia did not entirely identify with the kind of feminism practiced by the earlier feminists, uh, especially in the 1930s, they did not entirely reject the term. And more importantly, they uh, identified with the ideas behind it completely and added some new ideas, which is why this was new feminism. And indeed, they actually attempted to reconceptualize it. So just to see a bit more about what this feminism, new feminism actually proposed. Uh, on the one hand, uh, these were again women's, uh, like 
in Stebi's case, women's rights, suffrage, social justice. It was also like this idea of systematic change in society against charity, um, etc. Uh, the new feminism program explicitly listed uh, besides uh, suffrage, equal pay for equal work, broad social institutions, equal rights in parenthood, equal morality between men and women, marriage and divorce relief, women's right to paid work, democracy, peace, and others. Um, and the advocates of, novi of, of new feminism argued that the woman question was actually a part of a broader social question, and this was another continuity with the 20th, uh, feminism from the 1920s. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Good, thank you. So now the question is, if this was not new, what was then different in new feminism as opposed to the earlier version? And let us see now uh, just another example. And I am actually coming slowly to the end, so sorry if I'm being too long. Um, <laughs> So uh, what, was, what they are saying is, uh, quote, recently a strong movement can be noticed among women. It can be said that women are massively entering into the already established feminist organizations and continue to creating new ones. Uh, while for decades women's organizations were the object of ridicule and tasteless jokes, today they represent a significant factor in public life. Although the program has not changed so much, feminism itself has gone through great changes. The changes were influenced by the external circumstances and the program has gained a special deeper meaning. Uh, so here we have the emphasis on this massive joining of women, which resonates with the young women's attempts to overcome the lack of activism uh, among the older feminists in the early 30s. And also this emphasis uh, emphasizes the need to massively include as many women as possible, women of all classes, of all professions, political orientations, etc. Then the second issue that is new, and I already talked about that, is anti-fascism. And this is another uh, implication also of this massiveness. Um, then uh, other issues that I consider important are a much stronger uh, focus on uh, issues of youth and class, and also the importance of the concept of revolution for them. So just to finish with several examples, um, uh, as I said, Mitra Mitrovic and her fellow activists were a part of the broader generational movement, which called itself Progressive Youth. Uh, but in, at the same time, the female students organized separately, and they consistently emphasized the importance of understanding their position as slightly more difficult than the position of their male colleagues. So this is where kind of feminism comes in. And an example of that is Mitra Mitrovic's speech in 1937 at the Ženski Pocket Assembly, where she discussed the difficult situation of all the youth, male, female, working, peasant, and intellectual. So they were always mentioning all of these. But then she added that female youth is in specifically difficult position, and more generally all women who have suffered from the economic crisis. Uh, the youth aspect is also very much present in Milka Zhitsina's writings. Uh, and this include, includes her two novels from the 1930s, uh, Kain Put and Devoj Kazasve. Uh, Kain Put, or Kaya's Path, uh, tells a coming-of-age story about Kaya, who is a young peasant woman born in poor Yugoslav village to a working uh, mother of many children and an alcoholic father. And her second novel, uh, Devoj Kazasve, a maid of all work, was published in 1940, uh, and in this uh, novel, Kaya, it's still about Kaya, who leaves her home village, it's like second part, and begins her difficult journey uh, of a domestic servant, and the readers uh, follow Kaya's experiences in this work, mostly in Belgrade. Uh, and what is interesting here is that in her writing, Zhitsina drew from her own experiences as a dom domestic servant, but focused on writing about uh, experiences of young women of the working classes. And this aspect of the lived experience is something that I think was quite important uh, for Zhitsina, but more generally for this journal, Jana Danas, and for, uh, for left feminists in general, because it helped them uh, connect perhaps a bit abstract feminist demands with the concrete experiences of women. Um, 
uh, but Milka Žicina's work is important uh, also because it brought women's lived experience closer to the idea of communism as well. And I will finish with this example from uh, Devojka za sve um, to show this. So in this novel, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Žicina follows Kaya after she leaves, leaves her village. And we read mainly about her experiences in Belgrade, where Kaya works as a domestic servant. And uh, here Žicina has two male ca characters uh, uh, who appear, and their function in the text is, among other things, to spread communist ideas. And this is how Kaya learns about communism, basically. Uh, one of them is Costa, a communist with whom Kaya sometimes talks and from whom sh she learns. And he has this like uh, bookish uh, approach where he tells her about what he read, etc. And then the other one is Marco, from wh whom, uh, for whom Kaya has feelings. And then on one occasion, Kaya talks to Costa about her work. But then Costa interrupts her to talk and to explain things to her. So basically she wants to express herself, but he shuts her down and tells, explains, uh, mansplains things to her. And then the narrator uh, says then, uh, quote, he talked to her about work in general. He mentioned the smell of a forge, but he did not talk about himself or her personally. While looking at the black foam of, on his hands, Kaya felt the need to talk about exactly how she felt personally. By contrast, Marco listened to her, waving his hand and giving her a sign that these things are familiar to him, reminding her of an event from their past days. They compared together this or that workplace and they searched for words to express their thoughts. These personal feelings decreased before Costa. He rose above her, serious, older, inexperienced, and he spoke to her, looking at her as a calm teacher looks at his student. So having in mind Žicina's own experience, and this, as discussed in the first part of this uh, earlier, I, I read this expert as an example of, of Žicina's own negotiation with communist ideas and her implicit claim that the personal lived experience of people, and especially women, had to be taken into account in the framework of, of their thinking about the social transformation of society that was to come. And the final, final concept that I will mention is revolution, uh, of course, very important for them. Uh, and this is perhaps the most important difference between the earlier feminists and this new generation. Uh, of course, this idea of revolution was understood in Marxist sense as the working class's conscious struggle for a social revolution and overthrowing of capitalism. And we know today that it was not possible for them to openly write about revolution because of the censorship, but there are still some traces. And one example is what uh, literary scholar Stanislava Baret showed through her analysis of female portraits in Jana Danas, where she showed that the Polish Marxist revolutionary Rosa Luxemburg was portrayed one month after the Second World War had started in uh, September 39. Uh, and this portrait, while talking about Luxembourg, actually implicitly called for action. And uh, to quote Baraj, if Rosa Luxembourg's uh, life was a symbol of the struggle of millions for a better world, her name was a code word for the beginning of an action in this direction. But it is uh, uh, an underlying concept, actually, which brings together uh, the ideas of feminists in the 30s, this new generation, and implies basically that women's position in society could not change without the much needed social revolution. Uh, in other words, the social revolution was not the solution for women's problems, but only the precondition for the improvement on, of women's position in society. And I will uh, leave it at this without some grand conclusions uh, for this time, but I hope uh, that I managed to show a glimpse of multiplicity of feminist ideas of the interwar period. Uh, which I think are more complicated than one many, uh, what many still see through the prism of bourgeois feminism and communist, communism or proletarian women's movement, which, which I, I see untenable in the case of interwar Yugoslavia. And when it comes to the issue of continuities and transformations, we see that uh, this feminist agenda and core feminist ideas uh, were quite continuous. But what changed in the 30s was that feminists reacted to the rise of fascism, first by conceptualizing a feminist response to fascism, and then also conceptualizing new feminism, which brought a new vitality to the feminist movement at the time. Thank you. For